So welcome, uh, Andrew. And uh, as I said, we'll, we'll start uh, just with the story of uh, what is the story with you and philosophy? You're just, you're a teacher. What are you doing in philosophy? That's yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, thanks, Rob. And uh, good morning, all the uh, competitors and the uh, philosophers. Uh, it's great to spend some time with you on a, a Saturday morning. Um, look, my journey into philosophy, I think, is probably not the most uh, traditional or orthodox uh, journey in. I mean, I very much came to it sideways. Um, when we agreed to do this interview, Rob, I was very much thinking back, you know, when did it all start? Um, and look, I, I think the best place to identify was just informal conversations at, at home. Um, you know, what you need to know is that uh, my mother is a, a retired Church of England priest, and um, she was very much uh, driving this, um, you know, religious angle, I suppose, on, onto our family. And my response was always to ask questions and say, you know, things like why, uh, and try to work out some of these, these big questions that, that came up. Um, and she got really quite frustrated, I think, at one stage, because I just wouldn't take her answers uh, at face value, and I just kept looking for more and looking for more. And she said, look, I've got nothing more to give you. Why don't you go and see uh, this guy? And she sent me to her boss, who actually was the, you know, the area priest. So I sat down and spent the evening with him over a nice cup of tea. And again, he got to the same point and said, well, look, I, I can't really give you any more, but can I recommend you a book? Um, I thought, great, that's awesome. So this is the book uh, they recommended. It's Sophie's World. I don't know if anybody's come across that. Um, it was very recently published um, when, I was, when I was growing up. And those who don't know the background, it's written by um, a Norwegian guy called Jostein Garda, who is actually a philosophy teacher. And he tried to make the subject open and more accessible to his students um, through the idea of a novel. And, and that, to me, just smashed me exactly where I needed to be smashed. And it really um, satisfied a lot of my curiosity. It gave me structure to my questions. It helped me consider things from multiple perspectives that I hadn't previously considered before. And that was really the, the opening of the door. And then I just wanted more. And at school, uh, there wasn't a you know, philosophy course at my school, but there was in England something called religious studies. It's a compulsory subject in England that everybody has to teach. Um, but it's not as you know, uh, dogmatic as it perhaps it might sound. You know, if you're at a faith school already, you probably might understand what, what that means. Uh, but it's not just in England anyway about you know, the driving of a particular uh, religious background. What it is, it's all about looking at questions and I suppose it's its natural name in Australia would be the philosophy of religion it's sort of what we we tend to call that and and again that again uh, lit, a, lit a spark and pushed me forward so I selected it for one of my public examination subjects and it really enabled me to open up to all of these big questions that we find in religion you know what is God who is God what about the problem of evil uh, do miracles really happen and, and it was that philosophical uh, style of questioning, which I now understand it to be, that, that really was my early passion. So from there, I decided I'm going to go to university and study more of this. Um, but I didn't do a philosophy degree. And, and thinking back, I probably should have. Um, but my degree was in theology, um, the study of religion. But it was very much with a philosophical tint. So I, I selected all the philosophy of religion modules and um, my ended up loving that so much, I then decided to do a master's. And my master's was in um, the Holocaust, actually, Jewish responses to the Holocaust and Jewish Christian relations. And again, there was a very much a, a problem of evil sort of tint on that. And the more I saw, the more I was interested, the more I asked and the more I wanted to know. Um, and so naturally, I think, you know, when you when you finish your degree and you finish your master's, you're sort of thinking, well, well what next? And I went into teaching. And quite, you know, understandably, I, I started teaching my favorite subject, which was, you know, religious studies, the study of religion and philosophy. And, and I was, you know, had a great time doing that, that in the UK for a number of years. I think it was about 13 years we were working through that, that in England. And it was wonderful then being able to spark the interest that I had at school in, in young people in my classes. Um, you know, they were coming to it with, with very similar questions to me. And we were able then to really start to unpack and co-inquire and, and co-collaborate with uh, many of those uh, difficult, difficult questions. But my real philosophy journey, I didn't really start till we moved to Australia. Um, you know, philosophy as we would perhaps know it today. Um, I met my wife in England, who's uh, an Australian. Uh, she's from Canberra, actually. I noticed her old school Marici College is on here today. So, you know, um, shout out to all the Marici students there. Um, so my wife speaks very highly of her time there. And um, we decided to, to move to Australia. And we were both, both school teachers. and. Um, it's very interesting when you when you come to Australia with a background in, in religious studies in England, because unless you go to a faith school, it's, it's not taught in Australian curriculum. 
So I was very much trying to find a, a way where my skill set would fit. And I ended up applying for a job purely to teach philosophy and ethics at a, a school in the northern suburbs of Perth. Um, now, I don't know much about the rest of Australia, but, you know, philosophy teachers are, are very hard to come by, um, certainly in the school setting. And so I was very fortunate enough to get the, the job to, to teach philosophy and ethics um, at a high school here. And that's really where my eyes were started to open. I was then introduced to the philosophy in schools pedagogy, um, which is very much the, you know, what the philosophon is, is, is all about. Uh, I entered my first philosophon competition as a coach. And this really was my epiphany moment. Um, I took my students along and I had no idea what was happening, um, but I was suddenly very excited about what philosophy really could be uh, in the classroom setting. And, and rather than as we were teaching it in England, which is very much a history of ideas, this now was a real opportunity to teach thinking and to teach students how to inquire for themselves. So that was back in 2013 and I've not really looked back since. I've just been trying to find you know, every available opportunity to look for ways in which I can further my own understanding of this, of this uh, wonderful experience, try to engage as many students as I possibly can in as many avenues as I possibly can um, to explore philosophy for themselves. Oh, wow. That's a very interesting sort of uh, story. I, I'm curious about when you were um, sort of pushing back, let's say, against your, yes. your mother and in the family. Yes. I'm, I'm imagining these dinner conversations, you know, That's right. and yeah. then you're encountering Sophie's world. Did yes. you, did the word philosophy come up then or did, because I'm trying to figure out how did you, yeah. like you're going on to figure out your own pathway in philosophy yeah. in some sense, but is, is the reason why you don't do philosophy at university because you haven't recognized that you, it's, it's, it's like uh, palm olive you've been like soaking in it all this time but just not realized it um yeah I, I really like that analogy and I think that's absolutely right I mean you know I was it was the name the branding I suppose I mean you know looking at my, my copy here in front of me it's called an adventure in philosophy um but so you know you think I would have twigged that you know there, there was something that was that was going on there um but I, I think my part of the passion for me was was to really this is going to sound terrible, but to try and prove my mother wrong, if, if you like. So, you know, I, I figured a, the theology angle would have given me a lot more of an understanding, a lot more base with which to argue with her from. Um, but then, of course, you, you, you take it on from your own understanding and your own um, passion. And then that you know, widens and diversifies from there. So, yeah, philosophy is itself, as I said, I, I really should have perhaps twigged a bit quicker. Uh, oh, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it can sort of uh, take a while. But that, yeah. it's interesting that those, those uh, the initial impetus was around uh, questions about the existence of God, the right. nature of evil. And, and you even when you talked about your moment later on, you even used the word epiphany um, yeah. <laughs> to think yeah. about that. But clearly, you know, philosophy for you has involved a lot more, not only because you've gone into the you know, teach philosophy and ethics over the last 10 years or, or, or so. Yeah. Um, once you step out of the realm of sort of philosophy of religion as a sort of starting starting point, what else have you found really interesting in engaging students around? Is it stuff around ethics? Is that where a center is? Or do you think it ranges more widely and for you and them? Um, it, initially, it is ethics. I mean, that, that's that's the way in. That's the, you know, the, 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 the one topic that students really quite naturally enjoy because it's all about asking the questions of what's the right thing to do and, and how can we decide what's right? And how can we um, weigh up conflicting arguments and how can we evaluate um, conflicting positions? And, and certainly in, in our media world where we are, it's the ethical quick questions that seem to get the most traction. These are the, you know, the sort of less abstract ones, I would suggest, that you can actually hang something on. You know, they're about people, you know, they're mm -hmm. about lives, they're about situations and consequences, about the decisions with which, with which people make. Um, and certainly I found in, in, in the classroom, the, the best way to be delivering this uh, style of um, philosophy to the, to the students is, is through case study. It's through stories. It's through being able to identify and being able to relate and um, try and empathize. It's, it's a big, you know, um, personal angle to that. Um, I mean, I will find, you know, the, the more abstract areas of philosophy slightly more uh, tricky, you know, to engage students. Um, you know, the, the you know, more metaphysical stuff about existence and um, an ontology and you know ideas of being that, that really will go beyond our own individual understanding um but at the same time those are the ones that we really get into that really seem to resonate um you know at my, at my school at the moment i run a weekly philosophy cafe so it's just an opportunity for students to come along at lunchtime and bring their lunch and, and sit down about something meaningful 
And it's really interesting because the most, uh, the most popular and most attended ones are the ethical ones. So where we do a, um, a question about gun crime or animal rights or this sort of thing, you know, we end up, you know, 25, 35 students arrive. The more metaphysical ones are my favorites, but because they require an awful lot more of uh, concentrated thought. Um, one of the big ones we did was, was trying to work out what nothing is, you know, is there such a thing as nothing? Um, and whilst there weren't as, you know, perhaps as appealing a question, so the you know, numbers were a little bit reduced, that to me was where the big thinking happened because right, they, they, the numbers, to... the, they weren't reduced to nothing though, right? Oh no, <laughs> exactly. There was still very much something there. Um, but we were trying to, you know, figure out, you know, did this whole uh, idea about how do you put into words something that doesn't easily go into words? Um, and that, that's the real, where the, the real thoughts and real engagement seems to seem to be happening the most. Mm -hmm. And what do you think philosophers have to contribute to, say, just ethical thinking? Take take that as a, a focal point. It's where, as you've suggested, it might come up most around media in the in the uh, public sort of realm. And so, yeah. why, why, I mean, you know, play I'll play devil's advocate. Say, like philosophers, they're just going to give us more questions than answers. And what we need in ethics are really answers. So why why, yes. why don't we have people who specialize? If we, for example, want to do medical ethics, yeah. why don't we just have doctors? and get their expert opinion on what it is we should do in this particular should we have this operation should we have this as a part of public policy yeah. um should we have you know vaccine mandates that's a medical issue it's just that's something that's there are specialists for this already yes well, that, that, I, I would absolutely agree there are and, and you know and i think we absolutely do need to listen to the experts in those fields um it's really interesting because I've, I've been on the um uh, the radio quite recently just to do a little ethics slot um which has been quite good and i've invited you know people to phone in and, and talk about their ideas and one thing i've really noticed is that people are really good with opinions uh, people are really good with saying well this is obviously the right thing to do but when you ask them why that's when they just say well it just is that's just how it is and um, it's really interesting trying to have to, to coax uh, reasons out of um, their opinions. And this to me is where philosophy really does come in because philosophy is all about argument. It's all about putting together a, you know, some reasons. It's all about putting together reasons that will support the conclusion rather than just being a pure opinion based fact. Um, and I think certainly if you know, look at how it's portrayed in the media, it's, it's often those who shout the loudest, who are the most controversial, who are the most uh, outrageous in what they say are the ones who get the media tied because these are the ones that uh, sell newspapers. These are the ones that get clicks on uh, the internet. These are the ones which people want to hear more about. But it's actually, you know, perhaps the quieter, more reasoned approach that actually has the most traction and the most value. Uh, and certainly in terms of medical ethics, and, and when you've got, you know, real lives that are uh, affected by these decisions, I think it becomes a very dangerous place when you've just got opinion which is unsupported. So if I'm hearing you right, it's because philosophers can allow us to probe into reasons and to step back from just mere opinion. Is that the? Yeah, that's that's my uh, take on things. Uh, and I think you know when we can teach kids to reason for themselves and and also to be able to be um, met with opinions, other reasons that they don't necessarily see or don't necessarily hold, it's to probe again further. Uh, and your question there that, you know, philosophers just keep asking questions. And I, I think there's a very good reason for that is to make sure that the reasons that we come back to are actually valid reasons, reasons that actually are solid reasons that will then lead to the best outcome and the best decision. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a matter of uh, you know, reaching a new kind of consensus or, or is that what, you know, coming up with better reasons amounts to? Is well, it? it I I guess sometimes it can be. Um, and again, you know, this idea of what we call synthesis, it's where we've got, you know, two opposing positions and, um, you know, we bring them together and we come up with a new one. You know, this idea of the dialectical approach that has got lots of value. Um, I think it becomes quite difficult as well because, you know, there's a there's a, a right view according to society, but equally there's a right view that may not necessarily uh, coincide with with societal and we've seen this before all over history I mean if you look at the, you know the philosophy of science going all the way back to Galileo who comes up with a, an opinion that's really against public opinion but at the same time it's something that he maintained and, and defended and was able to uh, follow through on the, the strength of his beliefs that's that's really becomes you know something quite powerful to do mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know doing philosophy certainly in the public sphere requires a lot of courage um, you know, it requires a lot of putting forward opinions that may not necessarily adhere to the popular approach, but at the same time are those which have got most traction uh, and most support behind them. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious about your experience um, in schools. Obviously, you've, you've had a position as 
um, philosophy and ethics uh, teacher and uh, very, very uh, successful. And, and uh, we're you know, very proud of you, as I've said uh, over here in, in WA for all that you've accomplished, because you've also constructively um, contributed to the organization of, of philosophy in schools in this small, relatively small, small pool. Yes. Um, so it, it might be this isn't quite the right way to ask the question, but let me start there. How do you find the reception amongst your peers to your philosophical <laughs> endeavors, you know, as yeah. enthusiastic as you can uh, be with your students and generating all sorts of things. Is it carrying over? So in the schools, they're going, yep, that's amazing stuff. We're, we're on board. We need to become philosophers ourselves. Or yep. it's just like, yeah, why don't we teach like more real stuff? And Yeah, uh, that, that, that's <laughs> such a good question. Um, I'm, I'm often reminded, actually, and I've often feel like, um, you know, Socrates referred to himself as the gadfly of Athens, you know, that really irritating fly that just won't go away you know, just stop talking. Uh, that's how I very much um, think that I'm perceived in my school um, because I just won't stop. Uh, every opportunity, and I've literally tried for every opportunity in, every, in, in where it's possible in a school setting to try and bring in these, these skills, whether or not you call it philosophy uh, or whether you, you, know, you call it something else. People, I, I think, seem to be quite put off by the name sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, just a tiny bit dropped out just a tiny bit of video uh, audio okay do you need me to go back a bit or are we good uh just go back a couple of sentences but if you can't yes it yeah work. so i was just saying about how i've been really passionate about trying to get uh, philosophy or you know maybe it's the name of philosophy but the skills that underpin it in into other subject areas as well um so whilst i was employed to teach uh, philosophy and ethics. I was also brought in to teach Haas as well, or humanities and social sciences. Uh, and I thought there's a real opportunity here to bring across some of these big questions that we have in philosophy in, into my humanities programs. Uh, and so I did. Um, and so when we're talking about the atomic bomb in history, when we're talking about food equality and geography, uh, when we're talking about what it means to be a responsible citizen in civics, um, even down to the economics about, you know, how do we measure happiness? Um, I was bringing philosophical inquiry into those classrooms and into those lessons. Um, and that obviously caused a bit of a stir. People are thinking, what on earth is this guy doing? He's, he's going way off textbook. Yeah. But then when people invite them in to have a look, they, they walk away completely wowed. And they say, what, what the level of thinking that these students were, were engaged in in these, uh, in these lessons was just sublime. So rather yeah. than sitting there and doing these low level, let's read a book, copy out the questions, uh, give the right answer. We were actually probing a lot deeper, a lot wider, a lot further. Um, and so I've you know, gone further from there and thought, you know, there's a real opportunity here um, throughout many, many other subjects. Um, so I, I presented at, um, I was sitting on a panel actually, at uh, the, um, we have an annual Haas week here in Western Australia where um, we celebrate everything to do with the Haas and I managed to get a, a seat on the panel for a panel discussion. And at the end, one of the questions was, well, how then can we all become philosophers? Can you help us? to do what you're doing. And that to me was really amazing because again, people yeah. were then starting to see the value um, and starting to see how it can go into other subject areas. So yeah. I've been, you know, slowly working away. I've been chipping away at the English department because many of the things they do in, you know, in English uh, are very, very relevant to here. Science, as I've previously mentioned as well. Um, and I've, I've actually um, just secured a slot at the, the local um, digital technologies uh, conference in a, in a few weeks time to present on the ethics of digital technology and computing, yeah. which I think is, is huge. And I'm, I'm going to take the, you know, the philosophical uh, approach in the community of inquiry to that, you know, with an opportunity there for seeing how that might work in that field, too. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, because so this idea that philosophy kind of infuses or, or can readily infuse lots of these other subjects that we have and enhance them is absolutely. one that I've also been sort of plugging a fair bit at UWA. And yesterday I mentioned a number of the programs that we have, but these are common things to have across different universities. So philosophy, politics, economics, for example, is a program. Yeah. Um, that's getting a lot of traction. We have a new science and technology studies where philosophy, history, sociology, awesome. um, and the sciences themselves all sort of come together. And we're hoping to attract students who, for example, um, will do a, a science major and they might do a second major. Um, so they can step with a double major in STS so they can think about the social context um, in which scientific ideas get generated and scientific policies get rolled out. Now you can always fold that back into individual units or subjects, mm. but we could actually give have a more immersive experience for students there as well. The other the other realm in which I'd like to tease you out about, uh, I know you have experience in it, is the role of philosophy in, in the in the public sphere. So let's talk about yes. infusing other sorts of subjects within a formal learning environment. Yes. Um, but um, I know you'll have views about this. I'll just tell you one quick 
uh, and go, you know, we do these philosophers in residence. Yes. One, one of your schools. Yes, and, that's right. Uh, that was great. I was at another school and uh, issues came up about a particularly, uh, a particular controversy around a uh, near contemporary um, pol uh, political figure, a uh, Christian mm. Porter, who had been a student at that school. Right. And right. Um, the philosophy students were kind of tasked with conducting a school-wide discussion about wow. the impact of this. And apparently just uh you know sort of blew the minds of parents and others there were well over 100 people at this meeting because mm. it was a, you know, it, it came home uh, the mm. issue for them and uh, the philosophy students were were kind of tasked with leading the discussion uh yeah. for this and apparently it was really constructive in a in a, in a difficult and fraught sort of area so i yes. found that kind of impressive so you're stepping outside of the classroom but yeah. i'm interested you, you know you do uh, stuff on radio. I'm, I'm surprised I haven't seen your YouTube channel yet um, or anything, but um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you think philosophy's got to contribute in, in that realm and the sorts of stuff that you've done. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's brilliant to, to hear that that is being used such, in such a powerful manner. I mean, I can talk, you know, not as impressive as that, but only yesterday, for instance, we, we, we had our um, training day for uh, next year's prefect body. Um, and, you know, we're sort of working through the process about uh, where we go and, and what good leadership actually looks like. So I was invited along to give a little workshop and um, there were 80 students there. And I did a very similar um, approach to this. And we started teasing out this idea about what, what good leadership actually is. And rather than, you know, the idea about I want to be a leader because I want to wear the badge and look important and tell people what to do we ended up with a very real and very um, meaningful understanding about what a leader actually looks like within the, the school sphere uh, and the school setting and the school background. And, and that for me was really, really powerful just to see that, that movement, if you like, from what we think we know to actually looking at something a little bit different as well. Um, so that was, that was really great. Now, in, in terms of where that goes actually in the public sphere again, um, I think there's, there's a huge role for um, this, this skill, um, you know, if you want to call it philosophy, if you want to call it critical thinking, um, if you just want to call it, you know, respectful dialogue, all of these things, I think there's a massive role for that to play. Um, certainly when you look at, you know, policymakers, um, you just look at people in their day-to-day -day existence. You know, we've mentioned issues, you know, like economics, and we've mentioned issues like um, animal farming, uh, because again, in, in Western Australia, there's a huge farming uh, community. And one thing that, that's come out on the radio when I've been doing that show is, a, you know, a couple of farmers have been, you know, phoning in, giving their own individual perspective, um, which again is something that many in our Perth metro re region have never really encountered before. And I think it's just the bringing together of um, different trains of thought in a respectful dialogue where we can learn from each other. Um, and we're then able to make, you know, meaningful decisions, um, develop relationships, uh, and then ultimately help to understand each other an awful lot better. So, yeah, there's a, there's a huge, you know, role to play for me there, Rob. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm uh, going to you know, remind um, uh, students, facilitators, judges that uh, you can start to drop uh, questions, uh, comments in the chat. We'll, we'll start to pick those up as we um, end, the, end, end the recording. So feel free to, to start doing, doing that. Um, but in the last sort of 10 minutes or so, I wanted to move on to um, ask you uh, a little bit about your views about diversity in philosophy, both in terms mm. of the content of materials. You've talked about your particular interest and in what got you, you started. Um, for some people, that'll resonate. For other people, it'll be something completely uh, uh, different in terms of the, the content and, and, and area. Um, some people will be all about nothing. Like they'll be like, yeah, that's my thing, right? That's my, yep. my special yep. topic. And yes, uh, what really switched right. me on is it's kind of interesting. But I'm also interested in diversity in terms of who does philosophy, who get who finds themselves in a philosophy classroom. Um, mm. And we talked a little bit about this in yesterday's conversation as well. And, and you know, last year I, I was talking to Deb Brown about it in the conversation as, as well. It's a kind of you know, ongoing uh, interest of, of mine uh, for particular sorts of reasons. But what's your view of philosophy classrooms, would you say, as, um, as diverse as they could be? Are you pulling in a representative sampling of students or is it, do you notice sorts of trends? Or there's, is there more that we could do in terms of the kinds of areas that we, we covered to, in, to make it more, more uh, welcome? Uh, I mean, one of the issues that I sometimes point out to people, so, you know, there are many different dimensions of diversity so lots of things can fall under that the heading uh, but if you take uh say gender diversity uh roughly the ratio of uh males to females in philosophy major programs is roughly three to one if you look right. at the representation in the rooms here yeah. i would say it's one to three the other way around right yeah. um reflects the school population so so yeah. what's what's going on there but that's only one you we could talk a little bit about um disability we could talk Ooh. about 
um, sort of uh, cultural backgrounds, um, language biases, and all yeah. sorts of things that shape up who who feels welcome in in in, in the classroom. Does, does everyone feel welcome? Do you think? And that's a, a, a great question. Um, look, one brand new thing I'm working on at the moment, which has never really occurred to me, um, except uh, in the last few weeks or so. Um, I'm, I'm working in a school now with a significant indigenous population and uh, indigenous spirituality, indigenous philosophy is, is, is something I've never really previously considered. Uh, and one of the units of work, which we are you know, let, delivering... let me stop you right there. Hang on. Why, yes. why, haven't, why do you think you haven't considered it before? You, you're kind of this is your, your go to area. Well, that's the thing. Um, but, but look, I mean, you know, my, my previous school where I worked at in, in uh, Western Australia for eight years was um, very much monocultural. Um, it was very much full of English and South African migrants. And we I didn't really uh, have any interaction um, with Indigenous students, Indigenous teachers. Um, and so this, this year I've just recently moved schools um, and, you know, the, the representation of in, Indigenous students is probably seven or eight percent of the school body, which is, you know, a, a, a quite a significant amount. Um, and their, you know, their zone, their centre, their, their room, if you like, is right next to mine. So there's naturally there's a lot of interaction that goes yeah. on and I've, I've exposed a lot of um, gaps in, in my understanding. Uh, I've been chatting to their um, teacher, I suppose, main mentor perhaps is probably the best name for, uh, name for him. Uh, and we've worked really hard to get some indigenous um, voices into our units of work. Um, so in, um, part of my job as well is teaching uh, philosophy, is teaching uh, religious studies as well. It's, it's called religion, philosophy and ethics. And we're doing an, an indigenous unit now in year eight just to look at, you know, connection to land, connection to country um, and, and what that looks like. And there's a real... Um, interest i think from many many people and certainly in our school anyway about what that actually looks like um and listening to you know voices such as stan grant and and on the radio and his take on things and i think there's a real opportunity for um a real dialogue between um people of, of you know indigenous spirituality indigenous background uh, and those of us like me who, who really haven't um, and it's really fascinating actually to see if there's any you know common ground with which there is and if you're talking about you know the philosophy of nature um, the philosophy of the environment and what that actually looks like. Um, I think there's, there's a real opportunity there to, to, to really understand each other through this, this philosophical dialogue um, with, which, with which we've got going on. So that's one example, certainly in, in where I'm sort of pursuing things. And, you know, it's, it's, it's motivated me to do a lot more research, to do a lot more uh, exploration about what Indigenous philosophy, Indigenous spirituality actually looks like with connection to land and country. Um, and it's very exciting actually, to, to be presented with this new uh, topic, this new sphere. Uh, and you suddenly realise how much actually resonates with where I sort of already am anyway, but at the same time to be open to movement and open to looking at new ideas mm -hmm. um, and ultimately listening uh, to what's, what's being said. So that's leading to changes in the curricular offerings and or the methodology that you're using or yeah. uh, the, the yeah, students very much so. into philosophy classrooms or... How? yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, when I run these, you know, community inquiries, you know, the Indigenous uh, students straight away said, oh, we know this. This is like a yarning circle. We do this. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was great because then that barrier was then, you know, sort of removed straight away. And everybody was, um, the Indigenous students especially, knew what was the expectations were, knew how to, how to proceed with the level of respect and, and ability to listen. So that was really powerful. So, yeah, this new unit is, of work we're doing has, has been fantastically uh, interesting, uh, motivating, challenging as well, you know, to see where, where that's, that's leading us. And, you know, we're starting to hear more and more of those Indigenous voices come forward. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, the school must be very supportive of, of this development, right, and this interaction between the two parts of the school. That did, I mean, was there a history of them, you know, the philosophy and sort of, um, I don't know if you'd call it, you wouldn't call it Indigenous Studies, but there's an Indigenous yeah. entering there's, an, there's very much an indigenous program, um, yeah. you know, which obviously you know catered for, for um, the indigenous students and their you know cultural requirements and uh, and obvious needs to to have in a school um, environment. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure of the, of the background in terms of where where things came from, but it's really clear now that you know it's an integral part of of where where they are in the school. And you know, one of the assessment um, tasks we we set for them was how can we um, improve relations between you know, how can we uh, raise the Indigenous voice at our school? And one of the, the students very, very quickly said, well, why don't we ask them? And I thought that was amazing just to see right off, you know, this is not about us, you know, coming with the answers. This is about a genuine need for dialogue and a genuine need for understanding. And it's incredibly powerful to watch that, that unfold. Yeah. Do you think that's already present in our society now, that, that listening and, and knowing 
the sense of knowing where to go to and that respectful you know deference i think to the people who have the lived experience of uh yeah. right around the issues that you're trying to sort, sort of sort out or do you I, think it's got a long way to go i think there's still some way to go uh i really do i mean it, it almost seems as though the policy makers think right we've got this sorted we know what we're doing and um, we're going to do it this way um and then we get these you know protests and outrage and and i think if we you know i mean went a lot along it in the way of, of meaningful dialogue and wanting to listen and understand together from the start it, things would be very very different um, I'm very interested to watch unfold, um, you know, the, the current move in, uh, you know, the federal politics to see more of an indigenous voice in our constitution. And I've been, you know, watching that unfold. And I think that's going to be a very, very interesting um, story to watch as it comes through. You know, I really, really hope they, they manage to get things right. Um, and they, you know, they do do the listening that needs to happen, you know, to ensure we can get a meaningful move forward. Mm hmm. Um, and you know, students, as you as you probably know, if you had a look at the program, they've just talked about a, a topic on Australia Day. Uh, yes, right, <laughs> right now, they may have perfect. questions uh, around yeah. that and uh, reflecting on their own dis discussions in their in their groups. I was sort of uh, not quite being the um, uh, Socratic gadfly. I was too uh, brief for that. It was more like uh, some kind of uh, a drunken hummingbird, maybe going from room to room. <laughs> Didn't really get <laughs> savor the dis discussions uh, uh, in their in their richness. But we might we might end up hearing from you know, some of those, or students may reflect on the connections between those discussions and, and some of these topics here. Are there no, other brilliant? Yeah, are there other things that you want to throw into the discussion as we start to sort of wind up and open up for a broader interaction with uh, uh, people who are in some sense in the room? With this, is there something that you've? Uh, look, I mean, I, what? Yeah, what? One thing I, I would really value, actually, is, is just some input. If anybody's able to, you know, provide that. Um, one of my next projects I'm starting to put together is to consider delivering a, a, a podcast, um, which would be uh, aimed at you know, the students of, of the age with which you're working with at the moment. Um, I'm just, you know, obviously it would be quite philosophical in, in its approach, and just sort of wondering if there'd be any topics or any areas of interest. What I'm sort of thinking of is, you know, an initial sort of stimulus following the um, community inquiry sort of pedagogy and, and this sort of idea, and then open it up to discussion. Um, one of the things that's worked quite well on the radio show is sort of live discussion. That's very difficult in, in a podcast environment, but maybe there's an opportunity to um, record some, you know, community inquiries. And would there be an interest in, in students listening to that sort of podcast to, you know, hear other voices from different topics? Are there any topics in particular that they would be interested in uh, hearing more about or ex further exploration? Because, um, you know, really, I've got my ideas, but it'd be even better again to hear what the students would have to say about that. Mm -hmm. And would that be the sort of weekly thing or? Monthly? Yeah, at the moment, we're still sort of very much in the, in the idea stage. I mean, I found a producer to work with, which is really exciting. Um, and then uh, it would very much be of, of a regular sort of thing. So, you know, weekly, uh, fortnightly, just to um, meet, meet the need in terms of where that would be. Mm -hmm. And is uh, are there any secrets about where this will appear just in general podcast space or do you have venues? No. No, nothing really to die, die disclose at this particular point in time so i can't give you sort of any exclusive oh. access and all of this no, um, I'll, I'll speak to your agent separately once yes we that's right <laughs> exactly we'll go down that particular road um so yeah i mean you know that's something you know, my, my next idea and again it's bringing philosophy out of the out of the classroom really into the public space which is exactly what we've been talking about earlier on because mm -hmm. um, i think there's such a valuable role to play and, and the more space with which we can expose that to i think that's going to be very very exciting to see mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i think that's right and i think one of the directions that that the you know, philosophy profession such as it is as represented by the aap has headed in the last 10 years is to be much more aware of that public space and what we could what we could do in it yes you know, all sorts of levels and I, I actually think to have uh students taking on a podcast like this and playing a major role in it maybe yeah. with a little help and guidance uh, yep. from people but really being the ones in control that would yes. be amazing I actually I, I maybe that there, um, there must be some versions of this around but but to yeah, try right. and bring that out a, a bit more and to encourage people to take that that plunge and, and if we could facilitate it, I think that would be really oh really I, I wholeheartedly agree I mean the, the the seed was really sown actually from students themselves where they often come up with the best ideas and um, they started a, a school podcast um you know a few years ago invited me on as a guest and I thought this is great you know this is really good you know to be able to have this forum where students can ask the questions that are meaningful to them uh, but have a wider audience to listen to that sort of forum rather than just being you know the, the, you know, the dozen or 20 or so students you've got in the classroom yeah. just to give it that wider um, wider uh, space to to explore these issues yeah so one thing that started to happen a little bit in the university environment is you've now got people making tiktok videos for yes. philosophy instruction 
right? Right. So okay. Past, you've got something, you know, on a dilemma that might be an issue around uh, abortion, or it might be another, you know, about environmental degradation or, or something. And you've got a two minute TikTok video that yeah. is now yeah. used in, in the university sort of environment. It's quite, you know, obviously there's a lot of pushback uh, against that from, from some people, but I think they're, cool. they're really interesting avenues to explore new forms of social media and ways of in, engaging, right? That are- Oh, very more, much so. You know, driven by the by Im by images, but it's, you know, it's interesting to think how that fits in with the sort of more, um, uh, I don't know, uh, silent, well-paced kind of interventions that we were talking about yes. earlier in the emphasis on argumentation. Again, it came yes. up yesterday, it's the role of emotion in, in philosophical engagement and and, yeah. and, uh, and what might be used there, you know, but I, th I think we need all those tools, you know, uh, at our disposal and to think innovatively about how we might you know, um, engage a, a broader range of people. And, and oh, I, I agree 100%. I mean, you know, again, I'm you know, reminded as where philosophy actually began. It was in the marketplace where the people were. Um, you know, Socrates moved it out into the where the people were on a day to day. And I think this is, you know, the role of philosophy in our world today is to meet the people where they're at. Um, yeah. And certainly, you know, these new, new forms of media you're, you're describing is, is a fantastic, you know, a, uh, example of how that would, would look. Um, and again, you know, I've, I've taken philosophy down to the, the junior school at my school. We've been doing it, you know, years three and four, which has been wonderful to, to see them and meet them where they're at and to talk about what's important to, to, to those guys is yet another example of how that would be. So, yeah, I mean, I'd be very, very open and very excited to see other opportunities as to where philosophy could be put in that public sphere. It'd be great. Yeah. So, so I'm looking forward to seeing where this podcast idea uh, goes with you and um... yes. Uh, recruiting uh, active minds uh, into it. Well, that's it. that's the, the beauty of it. I mean, we'd be looking for special guests. So, you know, Rob, if you're ever interested and want to come on and, uh, you know, talk no, about I, certain I, issues. I, I'm thinking about people with real ideas, like young people. You know, <laughs> like that, you well, know. again, and that that's, you know, part of the dream is, you know, if we can get on board with young people and where they want to take it, it'll just drive um, and it'll unfold and, and you know, we'll, we'll follow the people. So that would yeah. be great. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, wrap up the formal recorded uh, part of the conversation now and we'll turn and open things up and see if there are any uh, questions or, co or, or or comments and um thanks very much for joining us in this of course you know, hang around to answer those no i will do thank you very I'll much shepherding them over to you as, as as they they come in um but uh yeah andrew rogers uh thanks a lot that's great no thank you very much rob thanks for having me and uh thanks for everybody for listening into the conversation this morning i, I wish you all well in the what remains of your competition um, and I'll be looking forward to hearing lots of exciting things from you in the future. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.